Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight for the third and final installment of our three-part panel discussion series, Return to the James Castle House. My name is Mackenzie Dunstan, and I serve as the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the James Castle House in Boise, Idaho, which is located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute people. I'm joined tonight by Brooke Burton, who will be moderating uh, the panel discussion, and former James Castle House residents, Nat Mead, Emily Culver, and Antonia Steen Bowie. Providing American Sign Language Interpretation are Sierra McIver and Jeff Wood. In addition to ASL interpretation, English language captions are available by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then selecting show subtitle. So live transcript, show subtitle. Tonight's event will run until about 7.15 Mountain Time and includes both a moderated discussion followed by a brief question and answer period. Please add your questions to the Q&A box at any time and we will get to as many as we can during the last 10 to 15 minutes of this event. This event is also being recorded and will be made available online in the coming days. So for those of you who are maybe unfamiliar with the James Castle House, um, we are a cultural site and museum managed by the Boise City Department of Arts and History. The James Castle House celebrates the life and work of Idaho artist James Castle uh, through a lot of different programs, including exhibitions, uh, community programs, research, residencies, and the conservation of the historic spaces where James Castle lived and worked for over four decades. In addition to cultural sites, the Department of Arts and History offers many other services and programs, including public art, history programs, archives, grants, and care and conservation. I want to thank the City of Boise for its ongoing support and commitment to the work at the Department of Arts and History in the James Castle House to uplift creative professionals in the community at large. So, turning our attention to tonight's event, uh, Return to the James Castle House is a three-part panel discussion series that is running in conjunction with our current exhibition uh, titled Interlude, a five-year residency retrospective. This exhibition was a first for us as it pairs contemporary artworks created by participants in our residency program with original artworks by James Castle. Through these pairings, Interlude uh, really invites us to explore this dialogue between artists both past and present, as well as the lasting impact on James Castle's home and creative practice. It is such a beautiful show, and I really hope um, if you don't live in the Boise area, or if you do, uh, you consider visiting us uh, between now and April to experience the show in person. So thanks again for joining us and for your continued support of the James Castle House. I'm now very pleased to pass the mic to Brooke Burton and to our three incredible artists. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited that you came out because you are hopefully curious about the artistic press process and the practice of making artwork. My name is Brooke Burton, and I have had the absolute joy and pleasure of interviewing all three of these artists at the James Castle House and going a deep dive in their work and their practice. So now we're going to revisit some of the time in their residency, as well as explore things that are inspiring them right now and things that where they dig deep to create the artwork. So I am going to show a brief little vision of each of their works. I have two slides and then I will turn it over to the artists who are going to tell us their name and location and their time what year they were at the James Castle House. Okay. Oh. Emily Culver will be introducing herself first. This is a view of artwork titled VMFA from 2022, made of nickel plated copper and hand carved stone. I feel like that was a little bit fast. Maybe we'll have to go back. Emily, is, how, about how big is this? Um, probably five inches in the longest dimension this way. Great. Okay. And this is titled Inheritance 2022, silver plated copper and hand carved stone. And about the scale here. The bigger one would be about seven inches in the longest dimension. And the other one is around four and a half. Okay, I want to um, really reiterate that these are objects because they are also beautiful photographs of the objects, but the original artwork itself is a, an object, three dimensions. 
coming from you, Brooke, that is a major compliment. <laughs> Thank you. I these are beautiful photographs. I would hang that on my wall right now. Actually, can I? Yeah. Okay. All right. Done. This is Antonio Teen Bowie's work. The title is "Like My Desire." Now for the life stars have to be fixed, to be luminous. I knew what I wanted, but I didn't know how I'd achieve it. 2022 hand cut paper, ink and paint, 83 inches by 42 inches. And just to be clear on this, any area that is white space is negative space or has been cut away. So the artwork itself is predominantly blue. Is that correct, Antonius? Precisely. Yes. So if it's white, it does not exist in this <laughs> image. The title of this is There's Fluency in Forgetting 2022 Hand Cut Paper, Ink, Pencil, Paint, 32 inches by 24 inches. This is Nat Mead's work titled Turning 2023, 48 inches by 42 inches, which we had a long discussion about the other day, and is oil paint on hemp. I would like for myself to draw attention to the object on the ground in front of what is a representation of a stump because you might miss that there is a sort of human form there laying in the grass. This is titled Homestead 2023, 42 inches by 48, oil on hemp. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing screen now and I'm gonna turn it over to Emily, who's going to tell us a little bit more about her artwork. Thanks, Brooke. So in addition to me talking about it, I have this here, which is actually a piece that I was working on at the James Castle House. So I thought that would be fun to share. So this is um, fabricated copper, meaning that it starts out as sheet and wire and tubing. And then I form it, I cut it, and I put it together with heat to make a form like this. Um, it's also got some cast elements. So it's got some bronze casting and then uh, a hand carved stone element as well. So in my work, I think a lot about what it means to be an object and how I can make objects that embody bodily qualities or corporeal qualities. Uh, I think about how we interpret objects how we look at something and read it and think about how we're supposed to interact with it or use it. Um, my practice is really rooted in craft. Uh, while not everything I make is made out of metal, I'm usually considering craft approaches that are rooted in techniques, histories, uh, a material language. And um, I think about those a lot and I teach about that in my day job. Yes, could you remind us where you are located now oh, and tell us about yeah. your new job that you had just gotten during your residency? Yeah, so it's a it was a really wonderful moment for me because I had just gotten my job teaching at Old Dominion University and then I got to go on a wonderful summer adventure to the James Castle House. Uh, so I'm currently located in Norfolk, Virginia and teach here at ODU. Great. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Antonius. Ciao everyone, my name is Antonius, polydisciplinary artist, forever student, and eternal hot mess. Um, I'm normally based in New Haven, Connecticut, right in Wooster Square, on the other side of the historic and iconic Frank Pepe's Pizza. Many people will say that New Haven has the best pizza in the country. I was also born in the Bronx, so I don't know. Uh, that's up for debate. <laughs> but I'm currently in Saratoga Springs, not in my studio, so I don't have 
cut paperwork to show y'all. But I did bring an ao yai, which is a traditional Vietnamese garment. And the Tang Teaching Museum, which is Skidmore College's museum, invited me, my sibling, and a dear friend, Mizu, to transform their elevator space into an installation. So if you happen to be in Saratoga Springs anytime before May, swing by. And a little short story about this that relates to my work. I didn't take my first art class till my senior year of high school, and I credit my really wacky Vietnamese refugee family for my creative education. And one of my fondest memories is being forced to put on fashion shows where we develop personas, talents, looks, everything. <laughs> And this was often when aunts and uncles got really drunk and they needed entertainment. So all of the kids had to provide. And I really like to thank them for shaping the way I move through the world. You're giving me some really great ideas for Thanksgiving next year when all the cousins are together mm -hmm. and I need to be entertained. Yeah, yeah. Just bring your wardrobe, makeup, markers. Oh, mark. Okay. <laughs> Sharpies all over the face. Mm -hmm. Antonius, I do want uh, to give you a chance to describe some of the performance that you're doing because we showed images of cut paper, but I know you're also doing performance work. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, a lot of my work, regardless of the medium, really explores my Asian American Pacific Islander identity, expands upon ideas of queerness and transness. And during my time at the James Castle House, I actually birthed my drag persona uh, whose name hey. is umami, like the sense, the flavor, but it's really announced like, welcome to the stage, umami. <laughs> yeah. Yes, wonderful. I know you were playing with a lot of name ideas during your residency. Yeah, and Brooke, you played a huge part in voting <laughs> and I really appreciate that. <laughs> Tell us the other names real quick, just. Oh yeah, my last name is Bui. Um, this might not be appropriate. Oh but... yeah, no. oh yeah, yeah. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. I remember. <laughs> I, I did Google okay. this. It was umami or Bui Kake. There we go. And you can Google if you wish. <laughs> I'm not explaining. <laughs> now I remember why that was so memorable. Okay. Thank you so much, Nat. I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself, where you're located, and uh, tell us about your work. Okay, um, thanks. My name is Nat. I'm I'm in uh, I live in Brooklyn, New York. I've lived here for like thirteen years, um, and you know I have, I have a, such a hard time talking about my work these days, but because um, it's so hard because I don't really I think of I have ideas that I guess inform kind of the images I come up with, but the image always comes first. And then I have something like this, and then I have to kind of explain it. Um, welcome. You are yeah. welcome. Which is good. I mean, I do think it's not that it's disingenuous. I, I do think the meaning's there, but I, it's not like a one for one, um, I guess. Um, but, you know, what I think about when I'm making my work, I think I'm influenced a lot by, you know, 20th century American painting. Um, especially kind of, I, I grew up really admiring like social realists and regional painters, um, the regionalists, um, and coming come these are artists who came out of a time coming out of the Great De Depression where Americans were really, America was charged with kind of forming a new identity, kind of a a positive identity to kind of pull us out of this this period, and so there was lots of like it was like a folk revival and lots of folk heroes around that time. And I kind of grew up loving that painting and kind of emulating it. So I think a lot about American myth-making and kind of these American archetypes that were kind of, are kind of, that I, the more I think about it, and also kind of thinking about patronage and my own father and kind of how tenuous and unreliable these, these things are. So I guess what I'm interested in is kind of the, the crisis of Americans, wow. of okay. kind of American maleness and of American archetypes and kind of not knowing where to look. And so there's a lot of kind of room for invention, but I think oftentimes, I think we're kind of dealing with 
in a larger sense. I'm dealing with it as a parent and kind of trying to be like a, a not a destructive person and a responsible person and a responsible father. And But I think as a larger society, we're kind of dealing with this fallout of um, kind of being let down by these archetypes. So that's, and then with my work, um, I brought a whole bunch of stuff, but I do a lot of, to kind of figure out what I'm gonna do, I do a lot of drawings. So a lot of like works on paper, different size paper, um, like quick, because I make the images all come from my head. So I start with that. Do you get visions of those? Like when you're driving and you're like, oh, I know what my next composition is going to be. You know, really it's an idea. And then I have to figure out what it's going to look like. So usually it's like an idea of kind of what I kind of have these, these, these bearded figures, these kind of reoccurring bearded figures. And so I do a lot of, this is like super rigid paper that I work on. And I work with this milk-based paint called casein. And I do a lot of these little things on paper, like kind of crank them out, do several of them to kind of then figure out what what my next kind of body of work will be. And it's kind of a back and forth. I, I have just as much um, investment in these as I do in the larger paintings. I don't think of like one as provisional to the other. It's just kind of a back and forth figuring them out. And with my most recent work. Sorry. Um, and let me know if I'm going too long. <laughs> oh, you are not, you have a okay. lot. Uh, um, with my most recent like body of work, um, I was think I kind of had this narrative. I don't think of these as narrative paintings, but I kind of had this narrative going through my head of these tr like seekers and gurus. And so I had these kind of, um, let's see if I can find an example. Like these, these guys with horses kind of in a Western landscape. And I kind of thought of them as seekers as if they're traveling, seeking this idea of this lone kind of last white man in a cave that has the secret knowledge. But the whole idea was that it's just an idea, it's a manifestation and it's a myth and it's not there. So that painting that you showed with that decomposing head is kind of the final outcome. It's like a, the ultimate failure of this of this um, quest. The so search, the quest, exactly. Yeah. For the wisdom from the one. Who, who is the one that has- Yeah, the, ma the man on the mountain, this this man idea. And so just growing up on the West Coast with people like- Paul Bunyan, sorry. Well, yeah, but also like, like Ken Kesey, you know? <laughs> the last show was called um, Hank Samper's Bones and Hank Samper's the protagonist in Sometimes a Great Notion, which is Ken Kesey's last novel. Anyway, that's, that's, that's is enough. A, much more appropriate than Paul Bunyan. <laughs> but say, yeah, same idea. Yeah. I do have to pick, I'm, you know, I like, I like to follow things that really pique my curiosity, which is, Nat, you said the idea comes first. Mm -hmm. And I tried to- Image, the image comes first. Oh, yes, right. The idea for what, yes, that's true. Because I wanted to know, do you get an image inside your head? And you said, no, it's an idea and then an image. Yeah. So I'm gonna really pick here, and this is gonna come back to you, Emily and Antonius. When you have that idea, is it driven by language, like a word or a feeling or a thought or? Well, I usually know it's gonna be a bearded figure doing something. Yeah. So the idea is, what am I going to have them doing? So it can come lots of different places. Like I went and saw, there was a show at the Neue Gallery in New York of Max Beckman's work, and he had a whole bunch of figures in water. And I thought, what an interesting, I'm actually just started working on this painting, but it, like, what an interesting idea to have kind of half submerged in water and that having to do with some kind of parental anxiety, I guess. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, I just kind of let them come as wherever, yes, on a run or at, in a show or whatever. And then I do lots of drawings and lots of works on paper to try and figure out what it might look like. Okay. All right. Emily, do you have a way that ideas come to you in your mind? It really varies for me. I don't have an exact formula. It's usually either that I have a form or a material that I get inspired by that I'm interested to use and see how I can use it in a way to provoke the body. 
uh, in a way, or I start with an intention of what I want the work to do and actually reverse engineer of how do I get to that point in the end. Um, so I go back and forth between works. Um, I don't, yeah, it varies for me. Did you play in the mud a lot when you were a kid? <laughs> Building blocks, thinking of material. Well, you know, it was always interesting. I didn't really um, play with dolls or Barbies much, but I sure built a lot of Barbie houses when I was a kid. Yeah. That was um, way more fun for me than... You were manipulating objects, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Antonia's ideas, are they coming from thoughts, feelings, words, images, visions? Um, I definitely played with the Barbies. Emily, I wish I knew you as a kid so you could construct houses. We would be the perfect match then. We couldn't play together, but we could kind of play together, I guess. Um, well, most of my Barbies ended up bald because I kept cutting their hair trying to style them, but like little young me with like really blunt scissors did not work. Um, when it comes to my portraits and vessels, I do use reference photos because most of the portraits are of beloved historical figures, friends, family, and all of the vessels that you see reference Vietnamese ceramic vessels oftentimes from museum collections all over the country. But when it comes to like my installation work, performance, all of that, I'm either inspired by poetry, writers are really, really essential to my practice, um, but I also really value improv and play. So entering a situation with a beginner's mind and just allowing the space or my the current state of my body to respond accordingly. Ooh, that's something I can add to that list. Does your work idea does your ideas come from the body, your interior sensation? Mm -hmm. Thank you all for sharing all of that. We're gonna now sort of shift from your current practice to reflecting on your time at the James Castle House. And I'm gonna spring something on you, the three of you. So no pressure, but if you could take a minute to close your eyes and reimagine yourself back in the studio at the James House, Castle House. Um, Emily and Nat, you were there in the summertime. Antonius, you were there in fall. So just take a second to recall the temperature the sounds, the smells. Maybe there was a certain flavor or a food that you ate while you were here. Is there the sound of you working or is there the sound of certain people? Okay, you can open your eyes. Thank you for taking a minute to imagine yourself back in the space. Antonius, I'm going to start with you and ask, were there certain sights, scents, sounds, flavors, or people that remind you of the three months that you spent there, or 10, 10 weeks that you spent here? Mm. Um, wow, thank you for inviting us to do so. It really did allow me to return to the James Castle House. And my time there was really, really love-filled. I immediately heard Goridos, uh, introduced to me by Anna Maria Schachtel. I thought of the baskets that Sam, who actually works at the James Castle House, was making. At the time, I see Jody, his partner. I remember meeting Shay, who owns Clay by Shay in Boise. And the list goes on and on. Um, oh, the Irma Heyman House opened during my time in residency. And that was such a phenomenal introduction to all the other projects that the Boise Department of Art, yeah, cultivates and the importance of art. I remember telling uh, the curator at the Tank Teaching Museum about the James Castle House and other projects uh, located in Boise. And she was completely mind blown. And I think a lot of people overlook Boise. Uh, and I really, really encourage everyone to take a visit. <laughs> I'll stop there for now. I can go on and on. That is wonderful. I knew that you had shared that you'd made friends during your time that you still keep in touch with. So, mm. yeah.
Thank you. I'm going to give Emily and Nat a chance to respond to the same question. I remember the beautiful light that would just like the ambiance in the studio itself. I think I hardly ever, even if I worked into the evenings, uh, as long as there was the last bit of daylight left, I didn't even have the artificial lights on because uh, it just really filled the whole space. And then the the landscape with the full window doors too just was so inspiring to be surrounded by nature in that way and felt really beautiful. Um. Well, when I was there, we were kind of coming, it was, they had canceled, it was supposed to be in 2020. So it was kind of coming out of like heavy COVID quarantine. I don't think they had, I don't think guests were coming to the James Castle house. So it was such a quiet space. Um, I could hear like Kristen in the morning there sometimes. Um, but I really just had this feeling of kind of which I think is rare for me, just this open, like the time just felt like I felt like I had so much time. Like the days seem longer, probably partially because of the season and like the, it, you know, it got light very early, but also just like, I felt like there was just such an open feeling like it's, which is such a nice thing. Cause I didn't, I felt like I could just keep making work. <laughs> didn't feel like there was an end and all of a sudden it ended, but, um, yeah, I really that and then just kind of feeling um especially with looking at the work at the James Castle House and visiting the archive, it just kind of um feeling a real connection with the artist, you know, while Weird. I was there. And, and yeah. feeling like I was kind of experiencing time in a similar way, maybe. Or hope maybe that was like a a a a hopeful feeling or something that I would I was hoping that that was true you know do you think that because the days felt so long and you said it just felt like the time would go on forever do you imagine that James Castle had a sense of that due to maybe being isolated from sound I don't know that's kind of what I imagine we can't project you know what his experience was yeah yeah, I can't, I feel like I can't imagine. I have to, ima I have to think that the, the kind of tactile net, the tactile relationship with the work and the visual relationship with the work, I have to imagine that that, that intent, that sense was intensified. Like there's a, it, it, it's a, there was a greater intensity, because, a, a greater connection, but it's so hard for me to imagine not being able to hear anything. Right. Well, it's weird that you mentioned that it was post COVID because I remember during COVID, everything was kind of quieter. If you drove yeah. to the grocery store or whatever in the streets in the very beginning, it was extra silent. It was weird. Yeah, I was coming from New York too. And I remember going to like the first grocery store or coffee shop and nobody had a mask and it's like COVID never happened. That was a huge, that was a shock to me. What year was that? 2021. Just when I arrived, I was coming out of, you know, Brooklyn, where I feel like people were still kind of just surfacing from the trauma and everybody wore a mask. It was just a much different, I mean, it was, once I got used to it, it was very nice. Yeah, very different. Yeah. You also mentioned that you spent a lot of time on the river. I got to bring that up, that you were putting yeah. your clothes in that cold water. Yeah, almost pretty much every day. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So this question is, we're going to start with Emily, but what do you need in order to create or to be productive? Um, well, like we've been discussing, I feel like at the James Castle house, I had two opposing feelings of being simultaneously empty and full at the same time. I was empty because I had the whole day to be creative and pursue and think about ideas. And then I also felt so inspired. So I was felt full being in the space and visiting the archives was one of my most favorite things during my visit and seeing James Castle's work. Um, so yeah, emptiness and fullness simultaneously 
I think that in order to make work, I need to feel some sort of itch, something that I have to scratch and investigate uh, to get to the bottom of um, a question. And then, of course, tools, materials, which can be of all sorts of varieties, but I had to, coming to the James Castle house, I had to be really strategic about what I packed and shipped and heavy hammers and what's going to get confiscated if it's in my carry on, et cetera. So that was in planning, interesting planning. Okay. I have to ask then, because yeah. you described it as an itch mm -hmm. and I associate itches with something that's an annoyance or a mosquito bite or a disturbance rather than say, for instance, a tickle. Mm -hmm. What would you say about the itch to create being maybe a, having a negative sort of connotation? But I would say, doesn't it feel so good to scratch it? Yes, it does. Oh my gosh, yeah. yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think it's both. It's some. It's simultaneously a, you know, I, I got to figure something out. I got to get to the bottom of it. I got to figure out how like point A, how to get to point A, point B, how to make those two things communicate and talk to one another. And then sometimes it's just a calmer curiosity, a playfulness. Um, but it always feels good to give it a a good massaging, a good inter deep interrogation. This this has really taken me to a place I didn't expect that is resonates a hundred percent with me as an artist. Thank you. Okay, Nate, Nat, I have a typo on my paper. Sorry. Okay, Nat. Let's go back to you had spoken specifically about the archives and about the quantity of work. Can yep. you describe um, if there has been a shift in your creative practice that you can trace back to your time there? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I was very, I mean, I was pretty familiar with James Castle's work for quite a while. So, but I feel like what gets kind of promoted and what gets like makes it into to museums or like there was a David a show at David's Warner of his work like a year and a half ago um, is the, the kind of more severe soot and spit black and white interiors kind of a rural landscapes and I feel like that kind of I, reinforces this idea of James Castle that I think people want to perpetuate as this kind of isolated figure but I was so kind of pleasantly surprised um to see like at the archive just all, all the color work the figurative work and it was, it was really amazing and i took lots of images and um so i guess i took that and i just wanted to i really wanted to just kind of crank through work work on paper which is what i did for like the first two-thirds of the residency and kind of put scrutiny aside um not think like at some point i'm gonna have to this work has to make sense. And I just kind of made images and had one thing lead to another and just kind of went with my curiosity. And I I just tried to make as much work on paper as I could. I don't know how much I made, but I kind of covered a wall. And um, I just wanted that kind of open investigation to happen. Well, you mentioned the word scrutiny. Can mm -hmm. you tell me who's scrutiny? Oh, at some point. Well, you know, I went to art school and <laughs> and worked in an art school for a long time. I mean, I still I teach a class right now. Um, and then, you know, show, showing your work and people, people like to know what it's about and they like it to make sense. So I guess that's all I mean. It's just kind of the, the push to have it kind of feel relevant and um, to demystify it, which sometimes I feel like is the last thing you want to do. It's demystify art, so. Thank you. Yes. So I think partly what I'm trying to get at, yes, the expectation for something to be relevant, to be meaningful, and to be figured out that you can say what we want to know, which what is it? Why did you make it? But the scrutiny, while it may have originated for many of us in art school, it can be something that we carry inside that's then an internal voice then versus an external. Well, yeah, I think that this kind of I don't know if it's fully formed but I had this idea yesterday thinking about being participating in this event is that that I feel like there's a real push to um 
kind of articulate the work or to investigate the work. But I feel like oftentimes, and I really felt this with James Castle's work, the work is the investigation. Thank like, you. That's the figuring out is the is that process. That's the really is the investigation. And so while I do feel it's important that art means something and art relates to society and it's reflective, all those things, I'm not saying that art should is this pure thing that's devoid of meaning or devoid of culture or anything. I don't feel that way at all. But I do feel like it is it is a, an investigation in itself. We can just wrap with that because that is like, the itch was good, Emily, thank you for scratching that. But you really hit the nail on the head. The art is the investigation itself. I would love to give Emily and Antonius and Nat also a chance to respond both to that question, which is, was there something from your residency that affected your process going forward? Or to the question I posed to Emily, which was, what do you need to create or to be productive? So open floor. I honestly think that the experience at the James Castle House hasn't fully hit me yet. Like, I think it's still here and I'm it's still buffering. It's still processing. And I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, in another year's time or year and a half, two years, that I'm starting to really see the the fruits of that experience come through the work in a more potent way. Um, cause I think I'm still kind of chewing on it, but it's definitely in there, uh, thinking about, I mean, the piece that I left as part of the collection, I think might be a starting off point. Um, the poetic nature of how, uh, James Castle used his body as the material in making the work. I think that that for me as an artist, I find that so intriguing and I'm curious to find my own understanding of that or translation of that in my work. Could you restate how he used his body just for anyone who may have oh, been unaware? Yeah. So mixing the his spit, the enzymes in his mouth with the soot from the domestic dwelling, which I also think is rather poetic too, to make a unique blend of the material. And uh, I also think about how familiar he must have been with that specific consistency and how he was a master of of using that material uh, and the only one that I know of too right um so yeah found that fascinating yeah uh, any other responses to the prior two questions or comments I couldn't agree more with so much of what Emily and that said um to answer one of the questions, as enriching and expansive as the residency was for my own individual practice, I will say being in Boise really emphasized placemaking as a creative practice in itself. From the James Castle House, Irma Heyman, thinking about Sorrell's place, um, admiring the way people like Co Calvin, who's I believe the founder and co-director of Drag for it, just all the ways to build community and a creative life um, to resist in that manner has made me dream in bigger ways than I could have ever imagined. So thinking about what my own residency would look like, uh, where would it be? Uh, what age group are there residencies for like high schoolers as alternatives to college? Like just starting to think in really, really expansive, radical institutional ways. I think that's what my time at Boise has really planted. So you're working on something big then. I have some dreams up my sleeves. <laughs> well, you said, res did you, can I double check? Did you say resist in that manner? Yeah, I would what say. What do you mean by that? I mean, I feel like we've all hinted at it, but the, um, you know, the, um, the world is complex, really violent climate crisis. And so often we all feel like we're not doing enough, I would say, or maybe I'm speaking for myself. Um, but 
And it's so hard to value our works our work as artists in a society that's so capitalistic that undervalues, underpays cultural workers, creative people. Um, and so, yes, our own individual art practices are a form of resistance, but at the same time, I do think it's easy to also be too individualistic or to perpetuate capitalism with our own studio practices as well by not you utilizing community and i would say um <laughs> not to think of music, but i feel like community is thrown around left and right now it's become a marketing scheme in itself no, I to, like, health and wellness and it's like oh what is true community and what i really admire about boise is its localism and i think Hyper regionalism, hyper regionalism or hyper localism, really focusing on those immediately around you, um, can be so powerful and is often overlooked. Yeah, I'm excited to see how those ideas play out in your work, Antonius. Same, still learning, making mistakes every day too. <laughs> yes. All right, well, during this portion of the night, we're going to allow each artist to ask a question of each other or both of the other artists. So we're going to go ahead and start back with Emily. Sure. Um, so I've been looking at both of your works, and I was interested to hear you both talk about the presence of the hand and or labor and how that is important in your practices. I was reading uh, some interviews about either specific material usages or and then thinking about line quality as well as copious amounts of material that is removed. So could you both talk about the presence of the hand and or labor and how it uh, aids you in your art making practice? Sure, I, I guess I could start. Um, yep, I mean, my my work, it's not like, ter the images aren't like terribly, um, the, the the kind of drawing of the image is not, is, it's, it's not like super complicated, but what the thing that kind of makes the work is I spend so long on a painting kind of losing and, slightly shifting the image and and making small corrections and what happens is it has this really kind of there's a lot of history you, the, the history is very apparent in the work because I kind of go over them and it's so funny because it's not it's very hard to see in digital images but there's a lot of like like worked over areas so I I, I have this kind of where I'm almost just like I totally cover it up with kind of solvent and paint and then I scrape it and then I go back into it. So I always kind of losing and finding the image. Um, so there's somehow that relates to, like I'm kind of erasing these guys and then finding them again. And somehow it, it, it kind of relates to what I'm thinking about in terms of the work. But I, I guess also there's this, there's a way with painting where the surface can mean something that's different than the image, which is different than maybe what the color might communicate. So I like all those kind of conf like that these things can kind of contradict each other and simultaneously. So you can kind of undermine one thought with another. So there's this, I think there's a certain amount of like, oftentimes my, my figures are kind of ridiculous. But then there's this worked over surface with this history. And I think we we kind of there's a certain amount of reverence that we that we attribute to the, a certain like a painting with a lot of history to it, with a lot of labor involved. So hopefully those things are kind of working with and against each other. Yeah, I think so. And so you're choosing your hemp material for the the coarseness, the quality that it has to retain uh, either the the force or the labor, the additive, subtractive, removing that you're doing. But then also you end up with this really rich textural, like grainy, but not in a way that it is. Uh, it just, yeah, feels rich with crev different paint in crevices as yeah. well as surface, right? Yep, that's right. 
So lots of like, yes, so there's kind of, there's like, there's indications of different decisions that I made and changes that I've made kind of throughout the piece. And like, especially on the edge of where there's like a form, there's a lot of little corrections. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you almost have like a haloing that happens with a lot. Yeah. And there's a delineation between subject background and like the elements at play. And the haloing is, it's not always like a vibrancy. Sometimes it's like a shadow, but um, it really helps. It makes everything rounded in a particular way, which I found interesting. Well, thanks. Yeah, you, you, very good observations. <laughs> I just want to point out that Emily makes objects that have a, often a lot of rounded edges. And so she's appreciating that you don't have a lot of right angles or hard edges in your work, Nat. That's yeah, cool. that's right. Yeah. Antonius, you are up. Yeah, let's see. I would say the subtractive quality of hand cut paper is really appealing to me, especially in terms of portraiture, because it mirrors like my identity formation. So much of my sense of embodiment has come through rejecting ideas of like how I should be moving through the world, how I should be dressing. So it's like rejecting and removal as a way towards formation. Um, and I would say the remains of the piece, the portrait that stands very much so uh, mirrors that. And I'm always interested in what forms of labor are considered art. Uh, my mom was like a maid, did nails. There's countless professions out there that work way longer hours and way harder than I do, but will never ever even be recognized. Um, another removal thing is like the trash people. <laughs> they keep our streets pristine and clean and that could be art or one could argue that. Uh, but so often they're deemed as just like sanitation workers. Um, or there was someone at the museum I was installing that literally just scraping the concrete walls the entire day. Um, and I was like, wow. sure that wasn't a, a performance. <laughs> I know. I was like, this for me, it felt like a performance. And I thanked them afterwards. <laughs> uh, but I don't think many people would have viewed it that way. Um, so if anything, I'm constantly thinking about where we assign value when it comes to labor. Yeah, to the unseen. Yeah, well, I think that was, that was really, I love hearing you talk about finding something by deciding what it's not, mm -hmm. right? It's like the persistence through the absence kind of or something like that. Um, that was beautiful. Thanks. Thank you for the questions. Um, is it fine if I ask you a question? Sure. Um, I found it, I remember opening your website and seeing object dash body maker and i love that label so so much and it's interesting because in many ways you you unmake bodies mm -hmm. if anything you like reorient our relationship to our own body in terms of handling the objects but also the way that we understand the body and so when i was thinking about that I was like, oh, so much of what I imagine your process is unlearning as well. So I'm curious, um, what are you unlearning these days? Everything, my gosh. Um, what am I unlearning these days? I am ultimately un trying to unlearn myself, um, understand, or trying to understand where I've come from. Uh, the tendencies that I have uh, to decide things, to think I understand things and trying to find out where that comes from. Um, it's funny that you bring up the, the definition I have for myself. I've also added thing to the mix too. So an object slash body slash thing maker. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
you might say, well, why thing? And I, I entertain the idea of a thing because a thing is an unnamed. It's something that we don't know. So we'll call an object an object because we feel we know it, we can prescribe a name to it. And then a thing is something far more ambiguous. It's a more in-between space. Um, so maybe the fact that I've added thing to the lineup also kind of answers your question of what am I trying to, or what am I unlearning, undoing, looking more for the thingness. Looking for the thing is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Matt, can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, I really hope I get to experience your work in person sometime because it truly feels like a mythology on its own. And I have a tarot practice, but one of my favorite things about tarot is not only inviting the people you're engaging with, to read the image, but also consider everything that's outside the frame. And I'm so curious to know what is awaiting the world outside your frames thus far. Oh. That's a good question. I've never thought about what's outside my work on the edges. I feel like I really underappreciated th that the picture plane could continue beyond the edges of the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting because I always think of like, we had that, you know, in a lead up to this, we had that big conversation about the size of my, the ratio of my rectangles. And I, I kind of think of, like I respond to work that makes like a paintings that have like a painted world so that everything that's happened is contained within that rectangle. And it's, um, it's kind of like it's it's like imposing onto the figures that rectangle they're always like right up above the edge and it always feels like it's imposing on them so they're kind of they're kind of victims of this world or they're kind of somehow it's imposing on their figures but you know i do like more and more i do want like more environments somehow for my figures and like more to bring in kind of more specificity for my own life somehow which is maybe like a very concrete version of what you're saying, but I do think like, yeah, I do feel like I want kind of more, I, th I think my work is more and more just about my own, ex less kind of outward and more inward. And I do kind of want some of that specific, that specific of my environment to kind of come into it. So like the paintings I'm working now have, figures that I kind of think of as my kids in the work. And that's totally new for me. Um, so maybe that's that's how it's happening. Yeah. I mean, really? the outside of my paintings is a real mess. <laughs> <laughs> as for all of us. Yeah. So that mess, is, I think maybe bringing that mess in a little bit would mm -hmm. be good. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, well, Nat, I think you had a couple questions as well, or at least one to get us going. Yes, I, I had a question, I have questions for each artist. Um, I guess starting with Emily, I really like thinking of your objects as things. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I I was looking at them, I just wondered like where they come from, like how you arrive. I guess we already kind of asked this, but how you arrive at the thing, is it, is it through the process of making or do you do you have a drawing practice or... You know, oftentimes artists have a starting point that's not even apparent in what the outcome is, you know, and it, and it doesn't really matter. And I tell my students that all the time. It doesn't matter. Is it where you get to, like where it starts? You get to decide if that becomes something you share or not, or something that's kind of inherent in the work or not. So I was just curious, kind of how you get to such interesting forms, like where they come from. Well, from a technical position. Um, I do a lot of sketches first. Metal smithing tends to be a process that at least the way that I've been doing it or I've learned how to do it, um, it's very a, it's very much a prescribed process. There's an order of how you have to put things together and how you have to understand 
fabrication and construction. So there's a lot of pre-planning that goes into it. So I spend, I spend time sketching to get like the perfect proportions. Everything is in relation to each other down to the millimeters. Um, and then it's funny when I put them side by side, the drawings and the objects, they're pretty darn similar. There's a few things that will stray or vary. But I think the other interesting thing is I also use the computer a lot. Uh, so my background is in metal smithing, but then also CAD. Uh, and I've used the computer in a variety of ways. And sometimes I use it to build an object. And then I have the computer break it apart into pieces that I then use as patterns to cut metal and form it. Um, sometimes I just use the computer for sketching, but I always, I think it's entertaining to think of objects being born in the computer, destroyed, remade by hand, recontextualized through documentation, and then being eternalized online. So I just, I think that that's an interesting, uh, inherent part of my process, but also just a, a lifespan of an object or of an idea. Um, they kind of look like, um, when I see the images, reproductions, whatever, flat images, they do look like they could be digital images because they kind of look like impossible forms. Right. And I've, so I've, I've also thought like, what possibilities or what futures might exist for my work when that line between the digital, the tangible, the real, the unreal starts to become more blurred. I mean, I could really make some interesting work where people can't understand, uh, does this thing actually exist or doesn't it, you know? So right now everything is still a tangible thing, but I think that it's pretty interesting. We'll see where it goes. Um, and for Antonia, I, I, I saw that you were born in the Bronx. Did you live in New York for a while? Just 13 years, and then my parents moved us to Houston, Texas. Yeah, so you've lived in, which is quite a, I kind of can't think of more different places. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong than Houston, and I'm sure there are, but it seems like opposite sides of the planet, at least in this country. And then you went to Micah, and then New Haven, and you're in Saratoga, Spring, Saratoga, Saratoga Springs. Now, I just wonder about like the transients and all these places and how they kind of how you carry them with you and if they find their way into the room, mm -hmm. the different experiences of these different cities and cultures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to stay still. I'm tired. <laughs> I'll be going back to New Haven tomorrow. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm just so grateful to have been able to travel, experience, artwork, people, meals, temples, et cetera, from places all over the country. And let's see, I, I still don't fully understand how all of them have informed me, but my relationships are just a fraction of the evidence, I guess, yeah. And maintaining those is all I can hope for. Do you think of yourself as a as a New Yorker on some level? Not at all. I don't ever want to move no. back to New York. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm like I can't anymore. My knees are too weak. The city's too expensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, some people start there and kind of carry it with them forever. But yeah. yeah. I think if anything, moving around so much has really taught me to not glorify any space yeah. and also always decenter cities. Like New York is not the epicenter. LA is not. Like we yeah. overlook so many places around the world. Yeah. You seem yeah. like the type of person who tends to, you nurture relationships. Is that mm -hmm. true? Like the first thing you talked about when you spoke about your experience at the James Castle was all the people. And I just thought that that was, yeah. So I imagine that you do that wherever you go. Intentionally or unintentionally. People yeah. just come into my life. <laughs> Antonius, it is, you have to remember the word that you taught me when you were here. 
Oh, unstrangering. Is that right? Yeah. The beauty of unstrangering people. Because I, I think about that all the time. I'm like, oh, wow. Beyond knowing that we were all residents, as of last week, we were all strangers. And now we're in the panel discussion together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. Unstrangering. Well, we have, I have like four questions left and three of them are doozies. We are actually at our time to open it up to open and question and answer for everyone who's participating online. So I will just close with the easy one, which is choose one word to describe how the work of James Castle has inspired you. And I'm gonna look at your faces and I'm gonna choose whoever's first based on who looks ready. So, um, Emily. So I just say the one word or do I get to explain the one word? Let's just say it because then we're going to open it up to question and answers. Okay. I will say Vantage. Okay. Antonius, you look ready. I'm not going to use a word. Okay, I'm good. Let's do sounds and movements. <laughs> Thank you. I don't, um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I think I know I was supposed to do this as like my assignment. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe like. Some kind of connectedness. To something. All right. Yeah, I just feel that he's very connected with, you just have such a sense of his hand, of his thought process, of the time passing, all of those things. It might even be similar to how people talk about being present. Maybe so, yeah. Thank you. All right, I think Mackenzie has some questions from our participants online. Hello. Um, Welcome yes. Back. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> Where were you? Hi. I always here, always watching um, from the shadows. Um, yeah, I uh, I've let our um, amazing audience tonight, um, who's also in the shadows, I suppose, of Zoom, um, know that it is time for Q and A, and that this is a great opportunity to ask Antonius, Emily, and Matt questions. Um, I haven't seen any come in yet, so I think um, people might be percolating a little bit typing out their thoughts. So I think, Brooke, if you do want to ask another question, maybe well, one of the doozies, you have time. Emily, well, I think Emily is ready. You, did you want to explain your word, Vantage? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, and I'll have to now decide as I backpedal if that was the best word. But I, going to the archives and looking at the work, there was multiple pieces in particular that I was really struck by. But one of them was uh, drawings of a pitcher, of a water pitcher. Uh, and Castle had drawn it not from the stereotypical silhouette where you see the spout and the handle, right? So you understand the like if you were to draw a pitcher for water right now, that's probably how you would draw it. But instead it was a dead on view and I think it was of the handle so it was flattened in space and I think it had ice cubes in it and I I want to say somebody told me that for a while or for a little while they weren't sure what it is until there were other drawings that started surfacing and through those context clues it made it clear that that's what the object was and I just thought that the perspective or the vantage point or view that Castle had decided to render this picture in and it not being the stereotypical one, I thought that was really fascinating because yes, that compressed look of the picture is part of the picture, but it's not what we think of when we hear the word picture, but it's still part of it. Um, and so I just thought that that was a really interesting and a really specific and therefore decisive way to make that drawing if that makes sense. And I thought, why? 
but I loved thinking why. I love thinking about how, like you said, it's the non-specific vantage point of a picture that is not that descriptive to tell us what it is. And you know what, in life, like Nat said, we don't always have to tell everyone what it is. Sometimes it's just is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, I'm really torn about wanting to ask Antonius to explain the movement and sounds you made versus wanting to just live in the place where I got to experience it and wonder about it. I don't know. Should we take a vote on whether we want any additional words on that or do we want to let it be what it is? Or we could all take turns following along. <laughs> I would do that. I'm I am riding the train that is whatever Antonius is doing. <laughs> no, no. I do not believe in dictatorship. No. <laughs> Sometimes I need a leader. Mm -hmm. Not a dictator, but a leader. Well, unless Antonius wants to go into elaboration, I do have an audience question, if y'all are ready. Um, and I think this goes to the whole group. So whoever wants to answer, um, this audience member asks, did you travel into and through the surrounding surrounding landscape uh, just outside of Boise? Did you, what, or excuse me, did that have an impact on your experience or the work produced? So while you were visiting Idaho, did you explore and did that show up in your work in any way? I mean, I definitely did. Yeah, I went I drove up into the hills for sure and like around Idaho City and went on hikes and swam in creeks and all those things. Um, geez, I don't know if it came into my work. I think I was kind of thinking, I thought, especially when you um, not as, as like not into the hills, but some of the surrounding area that's so bleak and feels so kind of inhospitable for humans <laughs> and I did have this sense of kind of what kind of early settlers must have gone through passing through that landscape and just heading west um so I think I, I had those thoughts I, I don't know if it came into my work but um yeah some of the flat land is, <laughs> just feels like I don't know how you would how you'd make it across some of that area I was just struck with such variety there is. I had never been to Idaho before, and I got to see a little bit and venture out past uh, Boise, and there was just so much variety. I had no, like, so much happening. And I know, like, if you were to drive an hour or so past where I had gone, there would be even more. So really beautiful. Same. My friend Chris visited so I rented a car and drove hours out. Um, and if anything, it really made me treasure small works because um, I'm like, oh, I can never com compete with the immensity and beauty of nature to begin with. So just learning to treasure writing postcards to friends, um, trying to capture a moment in my sketchbook, write about it, fumble with words. I love that. Thank you, everyone, for your thoughtful responses. Um, I got another question here in the queue. Um, how does it feel like the use of language impacts or changes the interpretation of your work? And I, I wonder if this question comes from there's been occasionally some hesitancy in, in trying to explain or dive too deep or uh, not let the work speak for itself. So that's an interesting question. So I'll repeat. How does it feel, or how does it feel like the use of language impacts or changes the interpretation of your work? That's an amazing question. Let's just give that a gold star. <laughs> That's a really hard one as well. I'm always very, I, I try to be really careful because it is a requirement of being an artist, but I really try to talk, I always say I talk around the work. I try to use kind of anecdotes and stories that kind of 
bring people into the work, but I also try not to um, break it down as in some sort of like where it's a kind of like the e the sum of its parts, you know. Um, I'm really hesitant to do that. So I, as much as I can, kind of, I'm fine with kind of, you know, how my how this how my life and my experiences relate to this work, and then also um, kind of bringing context into it. But I, I try to do it anecdotally. I try and do it through stories. And I, I don't, and I also don't feel, I hope, I really hope it's, it's, it's not necessary because, you know, when someone encounters my work someplace, all that language isn't always there and hopefully it's not necessary. Yeah, I find this really challenging and something I, I really relate to what you were saying as well. Uh, I always kind of tell my students, I use the comparison of trying to leave breadcrumbs for the viewer, the audience, so that they have enough to they, enough of a trail to follow. But while they're picking them up, they're actually going on a journey. So they feel ownership over what they experience with the work rather than me hitting them over the head or shoving something down their throat. So I I try to leave breadcrumbs when I'm making the work, when I'm installing and contextualizing the work, and then also when I'm trying to write about the work as well. Mm. Um, this isn't my way of avoiding the question, but imagine if museums and galleries at least once a month just took away all labels. That would be really special. And or have kids do tours of the work. I would do, I want to do that. I want to go on that tour. Right? I think we would all benefit. <laughs> kids who don't read labels and who aren't old enough to know history behind what they might be looking at. Yeah. Very fresh eyes. I love that. Thank, thanks again, everyone, for for giving us a little insight into, yeah, I mean, you're visual artists and uh, words can be interesting, tricky, inter interpretive. Um, so interesting to explore that together and hear your thoughts. Brooke, I think we're coming up on the end of our time. Anything you want to close with yes, before we say course. goodbye? I always have more things because regarding words on the artwork or words used to explain the artwork, it kind of sometimes feels like if you give away too much in the language, you're scratching someone's itch for them when really they need to scratch it themselves. So I don't have any other follow up words or comments, but if anyone does, I would love to give you the opportunity to Emily, Nat or Antonius and also just thank you. I feel completely inspired and validated as a human and as an artist and a creator. Thank you. Well, thank y'all. Yeah, this has been a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. And I really enjoy talking with all of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good job, Brooke. Thank you. <laughs> nice to meet yeah. everyone. <laughs> I know some of you had your doubts about this, but you've really, you've, you've really impressed everyone here. So we're ready to close up, Mackenzie. Thank you. Um, well, thanks everyone, um, and thanks to all our amazing attendees and your thoughtful questions. And yeah, if you get an opportunity to see um, these three incredible residents alongside many of our other residents' work um, next to James Castle pieces, it's really spectacular. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for your time tonight, and looking forward to hopefully seeing you all soon. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Good night. <laughs>